I want to welcome everybody who has joined us here in Haldeman Hall. And also, I hear there's many people online. So welcome to everyone tonight. Um, I'm Tori Holt, and I'm delighted to open up this great discussion, the um, Open Chain Family Great Issues Lecture, Working Towards Health Equity Around the World, a Practical Approach. I get to run the Dickey Center, and one of the best things about that is our founder's vision, which is following on Dartmouth President John Sloan Dickey, who said, the world's problems are our problems, and there's nothing that better humans cannot fix. And with that, he was dedicated to both bringing practitioners to campus who could think about and engage with students to think about these issues, but also to think long run about what tools does it take to actually address these. So both thinking and reasoning, but also tool sets. And so in great ways, that is what this series is about. And this series of lectures, and I'll in introduce our speaker in a moment, is thanks to Bill and Penny Obenchain. Bill is a class of 1962, uh, also a proud parent, and he is a dear friend to Dartmouth and to the Dickey Center. He chaired the Dickey Board for nearly a decade, and it's his support that has created this practitioner series where we can bring leading experts to campus to engage with all of us in this community and host a public discussion that we'll have tonight. If I can briefly boast, those speakers have included everyone from Hannah Teta last spring, who is the UN Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa and the former Foreign Minister of Ghana, to Michael Bromowitz, who runs Freedom House, to the first speaker, which was Hillary Clinton, and at her time, her colleague, Jake Sullivan, who is today's US National Security Advisor. So it's a wonderful group that Joel Lamstein will be joining us. So today we're discussing the future of global health and development, and also the last 40 years of that experience. Why does this matter? If you look at the statistics that were published in 2023 by the World Health Organization on expenditures around the world, the world had in 2021 nearly $10 trillion on health. But the part of the challenge is that that is unequally spread around the world. And nearly four-fifths of that money is spent in the world's most wealthy economies. So it's not getting out. We also know, and many of us experienced during COVID and the pandemic, that our public health system is greatly lacking in countries everywhere. And so if you're looking around the world, I think the number for 2021 is roughly 4.5 billion people, roughly the half of the world population, were not covered by essential health services. That is on its face just a massive challenge. So, not to put too much pressure on our future speaker and panel, <laughs> but I am pleased to welcome an early and very creative leader in this space, in the global public health space and global health equity, Mr. Joel Lamstein, who will be giving up opening remarks and then having a conversation. Uh, Mr. Lamstein is particularly well known because in 1978 he founded John Snow International, Inc., excuse me, which was to bring together a team of global actors to address these public health questions. He has served as his president and just finally stepped down in 2022, so I count roughly 40 years working in that space. It wasn't the only organization he was involved with, but it was the major one. And as part of that, he worked with everyone from large international funding agencies, governments, and foundations as well as to civil society and faith-based organizations, always pushing to improve the actual lives and welfare of people in the countries he was operating in across health, education, and socioeconomic measures. However, over 40 years, this world has shifted dramatically, and I know personally from talking to him that he has been an active thinker about this throughout this time. And so he will be looking at sort of the choices and challenges we have going forward. I must note, interesting for all of you who are undergraduates, he did not study first health, he studied math and physics and went on to work for IBM before going to business school at MIT. So if, if you're interested in multidisciplinary education, I think Joel is a leading light on that. I could list forever all the boards he sits on, all the classes he's taught on. He's an adjunct at many prestigious schools of public health, including at Harvard, Boston, University, and Tulane, among other things. But we're mostly delighted that he's been with us for the last month. So in a moment, I'll introduce Joel for the stage, but I also want to introduce my colleague, Don Carey, who is also uh, the Associate Director for Global Health and Development here at the Dickey Center. She uh, is a proud graduate of Dartmouth, undergraduate 86, also did not study public health first. I think you ended up with uh, what's anthropo anthropology and... Religion. 
and religion after trying chemistry. So there is all of that. <laughs> and also has her master's in public health. She uh, has also worked at the Global Health Council where she and Joel first met and worked together on the Bill and Melinda Gates Award for Global Health. And since then, she served in senior leadership here at Dartmouth, the Dartmouth Institute, developing curriculum and teaching, and also teaches today both in geography and biology. And as I mentioned, leads our programming at Dickey. So with that, I would like to introduce Joel Amstein to the stage, and then we'll open up to a conversation with my colleague, Dawn. Joel, the floor is yours. Please, pre please welcome Joel. Thank you, Tori, uh, and thank you um, to the Omishain for sponsoring this, to uh, Professor Lisa Adams, and for Dawn for allowing me to come here. When, when I was first asked to come, I asked Dawn, was it only because no one else would come to Hanover in January? <laughs> She didn't say no to that, so I just want to let you know what you're dealing with here. So um, I know we're, we're at a university, so I know you have to give trigger warnings, is that right? I mean, just to make sure you know whether you want to walk out now or in the middle of our talk. Uh, so here's the trigger warning. Um, I'm not an academic, very far from an academic, and I'm not a researcher. What I am is a practitioner. I've tried to do this for many, many years, and so that's the point of view that I bring. I'll tell you one other story, which will give you some sense of who I am. Uh, a number of years ago, I was uh, lecturing to a, in a different forum, in a different subject matter, to a big audience. And as you know, when you sort of hit something that's new, you kind of are a little bit insecure. So there's probably about 150 people there. <clears throat> and I was lecturing and looked out into the audience to see uh, whether I was re reaching someone. Did anyone respond to what I was saying? <clears throat> and it turned out that there was one guy in the audience. And whatever I nodded and said something, he nodded and said something, uh, or nodded. And so I went up to him afterwards, and I said, to him, thank you very much for your attentiveness. And he looked at me and it turned out he didn't speak a word of English. <laughs> what he was doing was nodding when I was nodding. And so I was getting my own feedback, which I loved. So let me, let me give you a little sense of my own background because I think it, it flavors the approach that I've taken. And as Tori said, <laughs> I went to business school um, after undergraduate school. And um, I was involved, I'm old enough to have been involved in the Vietnam War, anti-war activities, and led a little bit of the activities at, at MIT. And it just seemed to me that the civil rights movement, all going on at the same time, that in a very naive way, that this was unfair that all people of my uh, academic, um, academic point were all, almost exempt from going to Vietnam, but poorer people were not. And the civil rights movement, I don't have to describe for you what was going on there. And in a very naive way, it just seemed to me to be unfair. It just seemed uh, un unfair that this country should treat people so differently. And so that led me by accident to work with some professors at MIT who were developing a uh, planning model, fairly sophisticated planning model uh, for reproductive health, family planning, uh, public health programs. And they asked me, because I knew at the time how to program a computer, I can't use my phone now, but I, <laughs> could at that time uh, to help them uh, develop a, uh, that model, which led to forming an organization called Management Sciences for Health, which, which was st which still, went, still working productively now. And after that, about, and, and let me say one thing, 
I, I came from a sort of lower middle class family. I had never traveled. I had traveled only once in my life outside the United States, and that was to, um, to Cambridge, England, for a friend who, got, who had gotten married there. And I grew up in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. And if anyone knows anything about Brooklyn, what I considered over, overseas was New Jersey. <laughs> so I had never really traveled very much. I was really very unsophisticated. But what I was, and this is for some of you who are young enough, I was 28. And at 28, you can do anything. And so I was helping found this organization, even though I probably had no experience in doing it. At that time at MIT, I could have run GM, but I could not run a candy store. So you know, now they're teaching entrepreneurship, et cetera. That was not the case then. So I had to learn by by doing it, uh, and it was just, and again, this is something for students, it was just by serendipity that I knew this professor, who subsequently became dean, uh, that I started to do the work in the model, which led me to public health, which led me to MSH, which then led me to break away with a professor uh, and a doctor named uh, Bert Hirshhorn, who was one of the inventors of oral re rehydration therapy, the therapy for cholera uh, in what was then East Pakistan, but is now Bangladesh. Um, what, what was interesting for me was the focus on translation of knowledge that's being generated here in universities across, across the country and across the world into things that were practical. How do you make it work? Uh, and it looks a lot different. And when I came on the scene, uh, and I, I don't want you to think I'm a Luddite. I, 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 I do appreciate the uh, research that's being done, which is critical for us. But because I came from outside of the uh, industry, in quotes, I looked at it and said, well, there are great uh, things that have gone on, but very slowly, very slowly. And when I looked at them and asked people, they said, well, it's, it's the same thing that it was 10 years ago. You know, nothing had gotten down. And the question is, why? Why wasn't anything implemented? And the answer was, no one wanted to implement it. You got, a, you, you got your tenure by doing intellectual research. Uh, you, you, uh, you sat by the minister's health side if you were a doctor, but no one wanted to get down and figure out, well, how do you deliver drugs? How do you build latrines? How do you, how do you um, train people to do the work? And so the point of JSI was to find people uh, smart enough to do the research and smart enough to do the policy but who are much more activists. They want to get in and they want to change something. They want a systemic change. And um, that was critical to be an outside thinker because I was not acceptable in the public health community. I didn't have a public health degree and I, and I wasn't, hadn't, hadn't gotten overseas. But it gave me a different perspective which said, these are all great uh, research projects and ways of doing things, but if you never got, if you're inventing a new vaccine, which uh, you know, Bill Gates wants to do every other day, um, it doesn't help if you can't get those vaccines in the arms. So it really s said to me, one, this is the critical variable. Two, from a standpoint of business, just think about it as a business, um, it was a good niche. It was a good marketing niche, right? There are too many people doing research there were many, many people doing humanitarian assistance, but there were fewer people who were actually looking to try to implement something over a long-term basis. So it was both um, uh, sort of seeing this opportunity, both from a, from a contribution point, but also from a management point. So uh, let me just tell you why implementation is so hard. And, and by the way, the scene is very different now. There are many more good organizations like JSI who are implementing these things. First of all, 
it's under-resourced. It's always under-resourced. So whatever you need uh, those resources, somehow you have to find them. Now, most of them, notwithstanding all the foreign aid that goes into these and foundations that go into these areas, most of it is funded by countries themselves. But they're often very uh, under-resourced countries, which makes it difficult to uh, do this. Um, it's messy. It's messy. Think about delivering drugs uh, to, oh, I don't know, let's pick a place, Nepal in the wintertime. How do you get drugs to places? How do you... How do you figure out to get transport? How do you buy the, buy the drugs in the first place? How does that all happen? And it's very complicated. It sounds like it's easy, you know, I just go to Walgreens and it's there. Um, there are no Walgreens in Nepal, last I looked. And I, last time I was there was about three years ago. Um, it's all also political. And I mean political by a capital P and, and by a small p. Capital P, meaning uh, the country itself, who gives money to that country? Why do we give that money to the country? We give money differentially depending on what you think the purpose is. So years ago, I was working in both Kenya and Tanzania. Well, uh, there was a lot more money going into Kenya than Tanzania because Kenya was putatively capitalist and Tanzania was putatively socialist. And so the U.S. government favored Kenya. Now, if you went to any village in either of those places, you would never know which was which. Was which. I mean, people were people and trying to survive, and this kind of big political thing didn't matter. It, within the country, of course, there was also politics, which means that if you're, you're part of the country, uh, political elite, you're going to give money to certain places. You know, those places maybe, even in the United States, those places that vote for you, those places that have ethnic uh, compatibility with who you are. So that's always the case as well. And, and then um, it's all often subject, again, implementation. It's also, also subject to the donor's priorities. So donors often give money and... Well, uh, Terry said we give a lot of money. In terms of the amount of money that the U.S. gives or the, uh, to health, it's a minuscule fraction of the GDP or the American budget. Minuscule fraction. I, I use this in the class that we talked about. The GDP in the United States is essentially $25 trillion. The budget in the United States is something always in deficit, of course, is something like $6, uh, $6 trillion. And the USAID budget, total budget, is somewhere between 25 and $30 billion, of which maybe 6 to $10 billion, which is a lot of money, but think of it as a percentage of the, our GDP. It's not so much, and it doesn't go very far to many countries. So I think that's important. Um, and then, of course... You're trying to do certain work, and then something pops up. COVID pops up. Or we, we worked for many, many years in Ethiopia. Fabulous place, terrific people. We made great strides in helping uh, the country. And then there was a civil war. So a lot of the countries that we work in are very unstable. And um, a lot of them mean that the work that you do often doesn't go linearly. It, it has to stop and start, which makes it very, very hard. Um, let me just give you a sense of, well, let me say one thing, and this is something I think everyone in international development has to, has to understand. There are two things in international development. One is uh, scalability. Everyone could run a small project, Every pilot project can work because you can put in a lot of resource to it. But the question is, can you scale it to the country? Can it be something more than just a, a pet project by every NGO uh, that's out there? And the second part of it is, is it sustainable? What happens to projects after you leave? Uh, have you trained enough people? Can they take it over? 
Uh, in many of our projects, if you went back, which, successful projects, if you went back uh, five years later, the only, people, only things people would understand is the name. They remember the name of the project, but they don't remember what it did. And they probably have no sustainability of that. So those two issues, scalability and sustainability, are critical uh, to these things working over the long time and making an impact in the country. So let me, let me just say a couple more words about JSI to put it in perspective. So when we started JSI, there were five of us. Right now, there are about 4,000. And of the 4,000, probably 3,300 are from developing countries, so we're working overseas, and the rest are in the U.S. We, what's not known about JSI is two-thirds are international, one-third is domestic. So we have eight offices in the United States, one of which is in New Hampshire, in Bow, New Hampshire, working on issues that you can imagine between COVID, HIV, uh, gun control, opioid uh, use disorder, et cetera. So they, we have a balance between those uh, domestic and international. Um, and as I said, people think we're mostly international, but that's not the case. And one of the things which may, we may talk about is what's the difference between, why would you be in both the United States? And, and the answer quickly is the issues are almost always the same. The resources are different. The technology is different. But when you talk about social determinants of health, when you talk about inequities, um, happens in the United States, happens overseas. So let me, let me give you a couple of uh, things about what I think the, the world is changing. When I first came, uh, which is 40 years ago, to look at this, it was dominated by North Americans and Europeans going to countries and teaching them what to do, telling them what to do, which of course was never very effective if you think about it, but that's the way it was. It was all external people coming in and um, <laughs> because of anti-colonialism now, because of localization, and we can talk about what those are, um, those days are gone. So of the 3,300 people that we have overseas working for GSI, Every one of them running a project is a local person. Every one of them. And all our projects, and we have many, but let's say six big ones, every one of them is run by an African woman. Every one of them. And by the way, we didn't do this because of some issue of worrying about diversity, et cetera, which is important. We did this because they were the best people. And so, um, that has been a big change, and I think now everyone is moving in that, in that direction. Um, the implications for, um, well, let me say, this is, there are some implications for students who are interested in global health, especially U.S. students, but perhaps beyond that. And that is, uh, we hardly ever hire U.S. students to go run projects. We almost never hire, and I, I might add, we've hired a lot of Dartmouth students who all have been great, so any one of you who apply, you gotta keep that going. Um, but it's changed. We used to have people going overseas and running, and now we don't. There are still lots of um, positions for, for, uh, into, for uh, US students, but it's not the way they used to be. It, it really, you need higher skill level, you need, uh, activities that we can't find in country because if we can find in the country, that's where we're going to that's where we're going to do it. Um, uh, l let me let me tell you. Uh, and, and and the question for us is always, and this is a big issue in development. Economists will come along after you've done this for forty years and say, yeah, you know, it didn't make any difference. Your input didn't make any difference. Um, even though the infant mortality rate came down, even though the fertility rate uh, changed, even though um, the maternal mortality rate changed, there was a net effect and that what you did by going in, now this is my life, let me tell you, what you go, going in to do, you're told now that perhaps 
you created dependency. That, that what you think was good was only partially good. That there was an alternative way of thinking about it, which is outside people shouldn't be doing this. And that's increasingly what's going to be happening. And as it moves forward, uh, no one knows exactly how these organizations work. But one thing I would tell you is um, it's not clear to me that five or 10 years from now, the NGOs like JSI will be around. I mean, if you think about it, we were a conduit, a middle person, getting money from the government and from foundations and then using it in country with all local people. And someone might say, well, what do we need you for? We'll just go right to them. And it's a very good question. And it's the question that every institution like JSI and other NGOs are thinking about. So, um, you know, let me just make a couple of comments on what, why I think JSI was successful. Um, partly it's people, partly it's culture, and it's partly it's systems. So those are the kinds of things that made us successful. We're very good at picking the right people. We have a culture that is quite different than most NGOs. It's very flat and non-hierarchical. When I was the president, <clears throat> if I gave, gave an order, nothing would happen. <laughs> nothing would happen. But you know, through consensus, through uh, sort of good, good management, uh, we got things done. But it was, it was not consensual. It was not democratic. But it was very participatory. People were allowed to and expected to question what was going on. So as an example, when if you were new at JSI and I spoke to you, and I often spoke to the younger people who came in, I would say to them, if, you don't, if I talk to you in a year, which I will, and you haven't failed enough, you haven't tried hard enough. I want you to think, uh, let's do something different. And if we fail, we fail. We'll learn. There's a, there's a quote that um, I always liked <clears throat> from... Um, Samuel Beckett, which said, ever tried, ever, ever failed, no matter, try again, <clears throat> fail again, fail better. So it was that kind of persistence, willingness to try, willingness to fail, that allowed us to, to succeed. Sort of this kind of resistance and, and, and persistence, just keep going. Um, and so, I, as I said, I think the most important thing now going forward is what's the new model? And I don't think any organization has really come up with that. Everyone is trying. We, we have an affiliate in Kenya. We have an affiliate in India. We have an affiliate in Zambia. All trying to, all in different forms, nonprofit, owned by us, managed by us, completely separate from us. Uh, all trying to figure out what the next iteration is. And um, just to sum it up, when I spoke to young people who came in, and JSO is very popular because of this culture, because people got to do a lot of things very quickly, and there were no real silos. If they came in and wanted to do a public, uh, public health internationally, and they, and they get intrigued by homelessness, they were allowed to go and try to work on homelessness. What I said to them is, if you come to JSI and you think you're going to save the world, don't come. You're not going to do it. It's the wrong place. But if you come and you think that there are people around whose lives have been enhanced by what you, what you do, then this is a, the place for you. So it's really you know, getting students and getting uh, people, staff, who are so committed to women's health, to HIV, to homelessness, to opioid abuse, that they would work incredibly hard to uh, make this work for us. So part of the management was to set up a culture that allowed them to, to live their passion, to be able to come forward with their passion. So let me, let me stop there because Dawn said I had only eight minutes to sum up my life. <laughs> And I think I might have gone on by a couple of minutes. But thank you very much. And let's go.
Which seat am I sitting in again? This one. Hi, Don. Hi, Joel. I'm kind of hoping all of our Global Health alumni are watching this right now and laughing their heads off. So well, At least they can't throw anything. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I think my goal for the next couple minutes is really to pick apart some of the statements that you did and dig in a little bit. You talked about how the new system hasn't been invented yet and they haven't figured it out. And I just want to pull some threads out in hopes that maybe the folks here can go ahead and develop that new system based sure. on all of your... Sure. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning. You know, you founded and led many multi-international organizations. Yep. Uh, you started off with your passion, feeling things are unfair, right? Uh, at some point, certainly at the beginning, you must have had misgivings. Is this going to work? Is this not going to work? How, how did you thwart those? <laughs> how did you? Yeah, there were many. Uh, so JSI, uh, looking backwards, was incredibly successful. Incredibly successful. I don't take credit for all that, but it was incredibly successful. But I can tell you, as probably all of you know, you don't live your life looking backwards. So looking forward, I could have told you that we were going to be bankrupt 15 times. And in fact, you can't tell my wife this, but I had to second mortgage the house in order to pay for people's uh, salaries. They seem to all want to get salaries. I'm not sure why, but... And so that's the way I, I continued. There were days, uh, and, and I think we've talked about this before, a good organization who was doing what we did, which was bidding on projects, either foundations, Gates Foundation, or Welcome Trust, or USAID, or HHS in the United States, or CDC, if you're very good at it, very good at it, you'll probably succeed 40% of the time if you're really good at it, uh, which means you're, you're failing 60% of the time at best. Uh, and it's very hard, especially for people who are committed to these causes. You know, I, we wrote this proposal, which, by the way, now takes about $50,000 to write a proposal and takes a long time. They, be, they, they fall in love with the project, and then when it's rejected, they feel very bad. So it's very hard to keep yourself going in that. The, the advantage of having this culture where there was no silos, where people would talk to each other, that you didn't care about the hierarchy of center, um, people could buoy each other up because we, we were, we were um, bidding on lots of projects. And so if we lost this one, maybe we got that one. So if we could talk to each other, we could figure out uh, that it made it, it, it made sense on the overall uh, organization side, maybe not the individual side. So, and it is a very high burnout field, and so you have to be very careful, especially in an open organization where if people are discontent, everyone knows about it. It's not it's not siloed, and uh, we did certain things. This is sort of the managerial side. We did certain things to ensure that people would not burn out. So as an example, undergraduates who came and did a lot of the work backstopping field projects and going overseas, and we told them that the day they walked in that they were going to be there two to three years maximum, and then we're going to throw them out. Now, we didn't actually push them out the window, but we said to them, your learning curve is going to be incredibly steep, and it's going to flatten out, and we will have no place to put you and you're gonna get discontent, because no organization can grow fast enough to have positions for everyone. So the best thing you can do is either go back to graduate school if you haven't been in graduate school, or go work for someone else, because we don't have any more for you. So we had a lot of strategies to keep people going, understanding that it's a high burnout field. And, it, and it's a field, I mean, think about Ethiopia. We were working with the now WHO head, Tedros, on a um, community health worker scheme. There were about 35,000 in Ethiopia. It's a very progressive country in health. Um, and then there was a civil war, and we had to stop. It may go on again, but we had to stop. So again, if you think about that, that just breaks your heart. You just, you just nothing you did, but 
So it's very, you have to make sure that this, um, that you're doing a lot to make sure people are healthy mentally, otherwise they'll get cynical quite quickly. That's the internal culture, yes. yeah. and so everyone's happy in there. Not and everyone. <laughs> many people are happy in there. You still, you know, you talk about that failure rate or whatever it is. You still have external client, clients. People are still wanting to come work with you. How are you doing that in the face of failing fast or failing well or whatever that is? You mean how, how do we extra- attract, attract staff? Yeah. And clients, yeah. Well, well, clients, you know, one of the things, and um, there was a case written about JSI, um, one of the problems is, this is the conclusion of the case, it's, it's a very good cause. People are just in love with doing this work because they're making a difference in people's lives. It's a terrible business. It's a terrible business. For uh, lots of reasons, you know, you can think of from a managerial standpoint. There, there are very few clients who are going to buy this. I mean, I can name ten of them who are going to buy this. They're uh, very political. Um, there's a uh, high failure rate. JSI was a hybrid, partly profit making, partly nonprofit. But the whether it was profit or nonprofit, the rates uh, that you can make, surplus or profit was so low, and if you think about it, if you're in private business and you need money, where do you go? Where do you get it? Besides your parents. You can go to banks, where else? How else do you get it? Grants. Well, if you can get those grants, but they don't give you any margin, you have to just do it. Well, you sell stock, right? You sell stock. So if you think about it, nonprofits have no, no capital market, right? They have to be grants. They have to be someone giving you money. But there's no, I can't sell you stock to build the place. So it makes it very difficult in that sense. And um, the other part of the question is, we were very good at attracting young people. Very good. Partly because they're not old and grizzled like me. They're idealistic. They want to make a difference. As I said, we hired a lot of Dartmouth students, because they were focused on that, and they always wanted to do global health. Um, and because we were based in Cambridge, Mass., we got a lot of students running around. Um, the problem with that is they all stay the same age and I get older. That's the real problem. <laughs> um, and so we never had any, even when we were not known, we had no problem doing it. We have a lot of problem, a lot more problem attracting older, more senior people because they didn't like this culture as much as the young people did. Because if you think about it, you know, I want my own office, I want this, I want that. And the answer is no, you're not going to get it. And by the way, you'll get respected, not because you have a PhD or an MD or written whatever. You get respected if, if people think you're good and if you work hard and if you help mentor people. So a lot of older folks just said, you know, I've been there. I don't want to do that. You know, I want a special package. Literally, we had two people in every office. I need my own separate office. I said, well, you're not going to get it, Um, you know, unless you're doing statistical analysis and you need to be by yourself. So older folks had a harder time in this place. They... But the turnover rate after this young cohort, we said, turns over two or three years, the, um, the, the rate would be 5%. Mm. I mean, we had no turnover. I mean, that leads to issues as well. But we had no turnover because people got, it was entrepreneurial. People got to work on something that they liked to work on. Sorry. Excellent. I want to dig more into these teams that you're putting together. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the folks here know a little bit about what supply chain looks like in healthcare systems. Many don't. You talked about the new fancy vaccines that Gates puts out every week. The supply chain is everyone in between them, de- them developing that, the making, the getting it to the vaccination areas, getting it into the arms, as you said. So everybody involved in that. How did GSI do that in a novel country, a novel area? How did you put those teams together? Did you train people on the ground? What does that look like in practice? 
so su supply chain is you know the non-sexy part of health. It's behind the scenes. It's deceptively hard. Think about it. We were we were buying uh, and delivering antiretrovirals. Still are for the global fund. Um, think about how do you buy those drugs? Where do you buy those drugs? How do you get them into a country? How is it registered? How do you warehouse house them? How do you train the, the uh, shopkeepers, the, the storekeepers? Uh, how, how do you do all that? Well, we had to train. First of all, we, we found people in country who were um, warehouse keepers, and we retrained them. And we found people who are, came from UNICEF, came from um, you know, a d different organizations that su supply drugs. We found people from the private sector. You know, think about it, the pharmaceutical companies are all over many uh, developing countries. They have representatives. We got them to work for us. So it was um, the hardest part was that it had to be continuous. So these are life-saving drugs. You couldn't say, well, you didn't take it yesterday. You can take two of them today. You couldn't do that. You had to have something that was sustainable day after day after day. And my impression of, of many low and middle-income countries is they're, they're good at doing things episodically. They're not good at doing things continuously every day. So supply chain was one of those things that you had to have control over. And you had to uh, balance this kind of localization, everyone wanted to do their own thing. But just think about, I don't know, Malawi buying antiretrovirals. I mean, they're too small, they don't have the buying power, et cetera, so you had to pool them together. So you had to do this, and a lot of it was negotiation with countries. Um, but we mostly trained them. We, we have a, it's online, a whole training uh, course, a week's training course on supply chain which, um, as I said, is just one aspect of what we do, but it's probably uh, the one with the most impact, if you really think about it. Excellent. Uh, it's getting close to the time. I'm going to open up for questions, Philip. I have quite a few more questions, by the way, but I do want to open it up for just a bit. We have a lot of people online right now, and so um, if you are online, please use the Q&A button, and uh, Anais will share with that. Do we have any questions here? And the... Yes, please. I... We do want you to wait for the mic just because the folks online can't hear you unless you're mic'd. So. There it goes. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just curious what your expertise slash experience could talk a little bit about the situation in Gaza right now because the hmm. crisis is far too complicated for me to even begin to understand. Yeah, I, I can't. I wish I could tell you that, and I wish someone could figure that out. We did work in uh, West Bank and Gaza. I was in the West Bank a number of times. I uh, never got to Gaza because there was a bombing the day I was supposed to go. So this is before uh, the massacre and before the bombings. Um, and it, it, it's very surprising because, uh, so I'm Jewish, I was in, in uh, the West Bank. Um, it was a wonderful place. It was a wonderful, uh, Palestinians are very, at least in my experience, very entrepreneurial, very hardworking, very um, westernized in some, some ways, and very easy to work with. What was not easy was the politics. Now, the, I'm talking about the internal politics. Uh, when Arafat was there, there was, there was level of corruption. There was, you had to know who to go to, et cetera. So I don't know now how they're going to solve that. I mean, eventually it'll have to be solved. But um, it's a very difficult situation even before that. And I, I, uh, we had a Palestinian team, and one of the women who ran it, uh, who's a doc, was actually trained by the Israelis. And I went to her house uh, for dinner. And I asked her what she wanted. Now, she was in Ramallah. You actually can see Jerusalem from there if you go on uh, side there. So, so close. And I said to her, well, what do you want? What do you, what do you want? She said, I just want peace. I want to raise my kids just that way. And I said to her, will it happen in your lifetime? She said, no. She said, no. 
So it's it's a, just a complicated situation, and you know, without getting into the politics of which people here know better than I do, I, I don't know how that's going to be solved. I mean, eventually the the war uh, will have to stop, obviously. But ha- what happens next? Can they ever come to uh, any real peace agreement? I I just don't know. I wish I did. Do you have any thoughts on how best to deliver aid to Gaza, given the constraints of the politics, as you said, and the influence of Hamas? In every country that we worked in, and we were talking about Haiti, I mean, in every country we worked in, there are always groups there that are functional, that work well. And the, your job is to find those, uh, those organizations and work through them, not create something new, et cetera. So in Gaza, I'm, there are, I mean, there are a lot of sophisticated... Gaza isn't what you think it is. I mean, there's a lot of sophisticated people in these places, and there are people who know how to deliver that. And I'm not just talking about the Red Cross or CARE or MSF. Um, and, and what we found is always find those places and support those places. Help build those places. Don't start something new. So I suspect that's what they're doing now is finding those places. The NGOs, local NGOs, not international ones, and working with them. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, my question is on how to make um, nonprofits, specifically in health, more sustainable. I know you touched a little bit on how that has been, that is very difficult in nonprofits. How best can you ensure that the money actually goes there in a way that is sustainable and to continuously work well in the sector? Where, where are you from? I'm from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe? Yeah. I've only been there about 50 times. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the way we're going to make it sustainable is you're going to graduate here, you're going to get very rich, and you're going to give us the money. That's how it works. <laughs> Done. <laughs> that's, that's how it um, you, you know, the, as I said, JSI was a combination of profit and nonprofit. There, there's no distinction between. I mean, it, it, there's often mythology about what they're different, but they're, they're really very, very similar. Um, the hardest part is raising the money. And as I said, there are very few places you can go to raise the money. And the cost now, you know, one of the questions you might have asked me is, could you do it again? Could I, could I do it again? And the answer is be very hard. Be very hard to do it again because uh, the amount of money going in is not that much. The amount of competition is much higher now. There are a lot of organizations that are trying to get the money. Um, And um, the support is different now than it was then. Many of the, one of the reasons that we were successful, and I should say probably the biggest correlate was luck. We were lucky. We came at the right time. Uh, We were one of the few who started to do the work that we did. one of, the, one of the issues is a lot of the NGOs that you know about, domestically and internationally, are horribly managed. I mean, they're wonderful people, but they have very little management skill, not because they're dumb, but because they've come up from the uh, clinical route. They've come up from the social work route. They haven't been trained in management. And that's changed now. There are a lot better managers uh, to do it. Um, and you know, you at Tuck, I'm sure they teach nonprofit management. So it's important for people to understand these are complicated. You know, when we have uh, projects, let's say from USAID, which is where we have most of them, if you could read the contract, it'd be great. It's like reading Apple's disclaimers, right? No one ever reads it. Well, they're very complicated. You know, how you measure success. How you account for it? Um, how do you manage people? How much do you pay people? Uh, what's the local scale? All that uh, makes it very complicated. And you really need both sides. The programmatic side, you're doing nutrition, you're the programmatic side, but also uh, the management side. How do you manage all this so that you're able to continue on? And even if you look at the, in the United States, there are probably a million nonprofits in the United States, something on that order. Um, half of them 
uh, are probably under $5 million a year, and probably 25% of them go broke every year. So it's very hard. It's very hard. It's not, again, not because they're not skillful. It's just, it's just very hard to do it. So, you know, the more management, the better. And, and let, me, let me make sure. Um, I don't think managers have all this, the, the solutions, but they have to be part of that, and often they're minimized. So when I first came on and started to work in, in the U.S., um, and I said, well, you know, I'm just coming here to do strategy and, and management, and they said, ah, we know what managers do. They stop us from doing what we want to do. <laughs> and the answer is, well, you know, if you don't have the money, you can't do it. Um, so it's that balance, I think. As I said, it's much better now. There are many skillful people in nonprofit management, both here and, and overseas. And they're trained in, the, in, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, in Harare. I want to jump in. Tori had, talked, uh, had shared some numbers that really surfaced the inequity, right, in dollar form. Uh, you know, last year in October or so, uh, they announced there's a... Malaria vaccine, yes, super exciting. Really focusing the use of that in Africa, where it's endemic, where children are losing lives because of it. It's very Africa focused. At the same, about the same time, five cases of native malaria show up in the United States, right in Texas and in Florida. I want to talk about that tension a little bit, and you know, there's the funding side of it. There's also the attention on it. Is that going to change the way we deal with malaria or how we focus on malaria? Well, of course, in the overall scheme of things, insecticide-treated bed nets are going to have more impact than this vaccine does for many, many years. So, you know, often some very noble things detract from the overall solution. We spend all our money running after the last case of polio. Well, that's, that's important to do. But if you looked at the amount of money spent on that and you said, well, what happens if I gave that money to primary care, to community health centers, uh, the answer would be you'd get much more impact. So I'm all for that. But, but as you know, in this vaccine, and there's a new one coming out, mm -hmm. um, first of all, it has to get out there. Second of all, it's three shots and then one shot. Think about how you're going to get people to come back who live in rural areas where the malaria is endemic. It's very hard to get there. It's very hard to convince people uh, to take a shot. How do, you, how do you know about it? You know, it's always been the difficulty of, um, of prevention is, uh, you know, someone said no one ever thanks you for a disease you never thought you'd get. And that's what the problem is. People wouldn't want to take um, polio vaccines, the oral polio vaccines, they didn't understand it. They didn't understand why you're doing it. Um, and it was very hard to explain it. So I think, I, I think it's important. I think whenever it's our country versus some, someone else's country, I mean, just think of COVID, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's good to say, well, it should be equally distributed in the world. But if you're the, the um, governor of Vermont, or Massachusetts, where I come from, you say, well, we're not going to give it out to everyone. We're giving it to Zimbabwe, or we're giving it to Botswana. It's like, wait a second. We voted for you. This is our money. We want it. So that's pervasive. I mean, all countries are like that. I mean, all countries. So. Do we have any questions online, Annie? Way back okay. there is a question. Great. We have one back there with us. Yep. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Um, you mentioned that after executing a project, sometimes three, four, five years down the line, economists come and say, um, you did this good, you didn't do this well. And then um, you know, they, they sort of make suggestions. In many classes that um, I take at Dartmouth, it's so much the case where we take a lot of research papers or case studies to understand. And we realize that um, over time, some solutions could be more efficient. So, before executing a project, what measures do you take to you know, ensure that what I'm about to do is very efficient and you know, it will drive like, the best solution at minimal yeah. um, cost? And where are you from? Ghana. Ghana, my favorite place. 
Wait, I thought or, Zimbabwe was your favorite place. Well, that's... Oh, okay. <laughs> I, have, I have two favorite places. The first place I ever went to in Africa was Ghana. It was fantastic. Um, so there are two ways that these projects unfold. Some of it is there's a need in the country. The country reaches out, gets the Gates Foundation, gets someone else, gets money, and then bids it out for people like us. And then the other way is that the US government, let's say, or someone says, well, the big problem is in Africa is HIV. So you have to focus on HIV. Now those problems, and Ghana didn't, didn't have a big prevalence in HIV, but uh, the problem is the first one, if it's coming from the country, if indigenous to the country, if it's, if it's directed by the country, then groups like NGOs can come in and help them. If it's an NGO project, you could run that project, but it's not going to be sustainable. So the sustainability means, uh, notwithstanding how contracts work, that if I have the choice of immunizing kids, putting, putting needles in their arms, or training people to do that, well, if you pay me for the number of of uh, arms I, I immunize, I'm gonna do that. If on the other hand you say, well, I want it to be sustainable, then I'm gonna train people to do that. But by the way, it's gonna take longer. And some of these contracts or grants have this dual thing. They want it fast, but they want it sustainable. And the answer is it can't be. So if you, if you, if you wanna pay the price, then let us train people and then let them take it over. And those projects work. So when I said, you know, most of the external projects don't work, and, and by the way, and this is a question we've talked about before, what percentage of projects should work? How do you, how do you know? You know, I, I always, and I, I'm sorry about this, but I always use a baseball analogy, which uh, Ghana doesn't play too much, but um, if in the United States, if you're playing baseball, and if you hit safely, hit safely 30% of the time, which means you fail 70% of the time, you're in the Hall of Fame. You're the best player around, 30% of the time. So what percentage in development should, should work? And the answer is, I would bet it's 30%. I mean, it's not gonna work a lot. First of all, you have a you know, yeah, we worked in Mali. As you know, there's, you know, it's unstable now, and Burkina is unstable. And so that goes on. And then uh, you have the minister change, and this minister wanted decentralization, and this minister wants centralization. So all that is not because we're dumb, it's because it's a very volatile environment. And so you can't expect all that to work. But, you know, if you ask me, in the long run, what did JSI do? I would tell you nothing about the projects. We left um, some sustainable institutes and sustainable people, trained people. Those are the things that will make it work. Not this project got higher marks or that project. They, they did, but that's not in the long run the solution to the problems. Yes, please. There was a question online asking if you could provide a bird's eye view of global nutrition priorities and whether the focus should be on food security, hunger, nutrition education to prevent chronic diseases, or all of the above. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. You know, I, I don't know enough, I, I don't know enough technically about nutrition. We do have pr nutrition projects working on that. Um, you know, some of it is, um, Almost all of it is maldistribution, really what it is, and how do you get that? Uh, how do you get the right food to the right people at the time? And how you, how you again, make sure it's sustainable so that people are trained in, in the indigenous uh, areas about uh, what works and what doesn't work, what's good and not. So I'm not a nutritionist. In fact, I had a cookie before I came in, so that tells you. Yes. Before your talk, we were uh, talking a little bit about Haiti, and, and one of the things, I, I would say most of the stuff I've done in Haiti has been a failure from my point of view. 
But I, one of the things that keeps me going is something that our friend Paul Farmer told me, which was, you don't get to despair for other people. You don't get to throw in the towel. And, and I think if I asked the, the young people I worked with in Haiti, they'd say they'd have a different view. So I just wonder, as things have moved from this like colonialism and external grants and their definitions of success and failure, if you went back to all the people you've worked with, is there any, are they getting more of a voice to say this was successful even though it didn't meet some metric or, or have some external agency look at it and say whether it was successful or, or not? Yeah, you know, um, we also did, um, ran an organization called uh, World Education. World Education did literacy. It started in 1951 by a, a woman who I think they dragged out when she was about 95. Uh, and then I took over. Um, and they were doing women's literacy started in India. And we developed the literacy curriculum for Nepal. And so it was sustainable because we started it, all Nepalis, and not no white, no white people there. Um, we trained people, and then we left it, and off it went. It didn't work as well when the government took it over because the government has different priorities. Uh, um, but you know, when I was in Nepal, <clears throat> there were a couple of women who came up to me and said, "You know, you guys changed my life. Mm. You know, my my relationship with my children is different. The relationship with my husband is different. My relationship with the with the community is different. I think of myself as a literate person. I mean, it was not high literacy, but a literate person." So I say to people, if that's not enough for you, don't be in this field. You know, just, I mean, for me, the fact that there are people walking around who lives have been enhanced by what we do, I mean, how many people go to, go to sleep every night and say, well, maybe I failed a lot, but there are people who are alive because of what we've done. To me, that's the reason you do it. And as I said, there is enough people around in the world. You know, I know everyone at Dartmouth wants to go to medical school or um, Goldman Sachs. But, uh, and those people, you, you know, they're good luck to them. I hope they make a lot of money and give it to us. But uh, you know, you're never going to get those people. But you're going to get people who are passionate about these causes. And that, that's what sustains them. You know, it's not the statistics of how many are. It's, you know, I met this person. I, I, I could see what's happening in this village, et cetera. To me, that was, you know, I lived my life that way. And I never regretted a, a day of, of uh, doing the kind of work that led to people's lives being enhanced. So. I, I, yes, one more. Um, thank you for your talk. I was wondering how um, does instability affect JSI projects internationally, and how do you navigate the pressure from investors or employee morale and long-term impact without necessarily pulling projects from the country and not um, and avoiding favoring stable donor darling countries? So um, there are two ways we typically get projects. One way is that we, because we have people from all over the world working for us, come up and say, you know, there's a big issue in um, Zambia, and it's really important we should do something about it. Um, and we then try to get funding for it. That's about 25% of the time. 75% of the time, <clears throat> it's the funding agencies say there's a big problem in Zambia, and you go work on it. Right. Now, if you asked anyone who worked at GSI, they, they would think the reverse was better. It should be ideas that we get, not ideas that are imposed on us. But that's just the way the world works. And we are very selective in the projects we take. So if we don't, if we don't um, know much about the country, and we always send people to the country, and we, because we're big enough now, have people in every, in every country, um, if we think it's not going to make a difference, it's just something um, political. You know, we want to support some people, countries, we don't want to support others. Uh, we really won't do it. And if we don't have um, cultural knowledge, and if we don't have 
we don't know the, the right local NGOs, and we don't know the right people, we won't bid on it. So it's just trying to narrow it down to what we know and what we can control. Certain things we can't. And even in um, AID projects, and, and I should say that AID is a horrible bureaucracy, but the people are great. I mean, they're not, they're not dumb, they're, they're great. Even there, there are many times where we know that 50% of this project isn't going to work very well. So the buy-in is we have to do that 50% to show them and allow us to do the other 50%, which we think really is going to work. Mm -hmm. So it's an implementation strategy. You can't say to them, no, we won't do it, because then you won't get the project. But you can say, well, the buy-in is we're not going to get all the money, but we'll get some of the money, and we can work on that. I'm going to close with asking you for a bit of advice as you look around. You can see lots of impassioned young faces here. And uh, you already said JSI is going to close its doors in five years. That's one thing. No, I know. Not. <laughs> but the, 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 the arc that you've seen in the change in global health, it's very different than it was 40 years yes. ago. And yes. I'm hoping you can share that in the face of dwindling funds and broader knowledge in uh, other countries, share what can they bring to the table? What should they be working on to become part of the solution? Because the problems are still there. Yeah. I, I just had a debate with one of the deans um, in the public health school who um, I argued with, they're pumping out, they're pumping out too many uh, MPH people who want to go into global health. And if you think of JSI as one of the uh, organizations, we're not hiring those people to go out and run projects. So why do you pump out all these people? Well, there's huge interest in that. So, and my guess is that 75% of them will work on US healthcare because there's not that much difference. But if I were advise students who really wanted to get in this, I would say that you need skills that are high level, whether it's in research, whether it's monitoring and evaluation, whether it's in management, whether it's in analytics. Just think of, we need those people. We hire those people. Um, but you, the idea that you're going to go out uh, to Malawi and run a project, you're the one running it, it's not going to happen. So you have to be realistic about where you fit in the ecosystem. But there's still plenty of jobs to do it. It's just those jobs have changed. And they'll change again as we find out um, how the JSI of the world work. One, one aspect of that may be, if you think about it, we may be a regional consulting hub. So we may not do long-term projects five years from now. We have an affiliate in Kenya, fully Kenyan. And um, you can think of that, and it's doing mostly supply chain right now, but you can think of that as a regional hub for all the work that we're doing now. Not to run a project, but like, like uh, McKinsey, like Bain, like coming in, solving a problem on a regional basis, and that's what the organization's going to look like. So that's one variant of a how we're thinking about the organization. So, but there are jobs for sure. We need all the good people we, uh, we, uh, we can get. We need you to vote correctly for foreign aid and for um, the, the right kind of health activities. Um, and we need you to be realistic about what we can do. We as outsiders can do. You, you, can, you can help countries. You can add skills, and that's very desired but you can't run the health projects. The countries have to run it, and you have to support the countries. And you have to understand that, because before it was the, you know, almost the, you know, the white savior syndrome. We're coming in, and we're going to save you. And the answer is that's not true. First of all, it was never true. And second of all, countries are sophisticated. They know what they need. They will be selective in trying to get the right people to do that. As I said, maybe consulting like, uh, the kinds of skills that they don't have in country or not readily available. 
Thank you for ending on that hopeful note. I appreciate it. We, we did the full roller coaster throughout. <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping you all will join me, not, thanking him not only for tonight, but also the month uh, that you've spent with us and our students and sharing all that you know. Well, that's a very minimal level of what I know. But I, I, I would say, as I said at the beginning, it's been a delight. I mean, I've, I know some of the students we've We've had uh, discussions together, terrific students, very open, very warm. And um, this is just a plug, but you know, I, I, this is a very difficult time for the country, difficult time for the world. But this generation is so much better, so much uh, broader, so much no more knowledgeable than I was at this age, that I have great hopes for the country and for the world. And I just hope you Whatever you do, I mean, if you, you know, work in private sector, which is fine, is you'll be involved in your church or your synagogue or something in this kind of thing. Just be sensitive to those things and contribute back in whatever you, way you can. One, vote, and two, get involved because we, we need all those good people. With that, thank you so much. <laughs>